that's actually going to teach the class today. Michelle Hyatt has been with us for many, many years. She basically is my right hand person. Anything that blooms, that's hers. <laughs> so, the vegetables. So, vegetables, herbs, flowers. She controls basically half of the nursery uh, directly. She has a direct influence on that. She also does a lot of um, on site consults. She, we couldn't run the place without Michelle. And she's one of our teachers here at the at Waters Garden Center just because she's a wealth of knowledge. Even I learn stuff when I listen to Michelle. So, today is pretty technical. You're going to need your pen and paper. And, taking notes kind of stuff, uh, just because we're going deep into the garden weeds to figure out how to keep them healthy. Uh, and so I'm sure she's gonna cover food, bugs, and all this other stuff. And I think I even saw a couple of samples. And then hopefully I told her, don't leave them on a downer. These are gardeners. Inspire them some so they can see something they can plant. If something dies, they can replace it with something that loves to eat because we're coming into the heat of the summer. Summer solstice is next week, right? I think so. It's 21st or 20th. One of those. Anyway, why don't we give it up for Michelle Hyatt? Um, it, it's been a, a few months since you guys have been here. Um, usually during our peak season in May, we kind of take a break. It's just so busy. There's just not enough space for everyone to come in for a class. So we're, we're back and we'll have classes through the fall. Um, we do them every Saturday and they are free. Uh, so please come, enjoy, learn something. Um, it's a great time for asking questions and all that. So uh, again, welcome. And uh, today's class is on um, all the problems that we're all having in our garden um, between the, the bugs and the temperature fluctuations, watering, uh, diseases. Uh, we're seeing the whole gamut of it. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of tough this time of year. June is just a tough month. Um, our heat <coughs> spikes up, the wind starts blowing, and, and our plants just really don't get much of a break. And then uh, last week we had that cold <coughs> spell where we actually got down into the 40s and, and so things went, ah, what is, what's happening? Um, so you probably saw some things go on uh, after the fact that it is, is caused by that temperature swing. Um, so the first thing we're going to uh, talk about is watering. And um, it, it's an integral part uh, of our lifestyle here. And what I like to emphasize with the whole watering thing is a lot of us are from other places, California, the Midwest, the East Coast, Washington State. There are so many different climates and then we're all put here in Prescott, Arizona, which is very unique in itself. Um, we're technically a high desert, um, which basically means we're very, very dry, um, but we're mountainous, so we have that winter time temperature drops um, usually we get down into the, the single digits when, at winter time. Um, so we do get to see the four seasons, which is an awesome thing for most of us. I love the four seasons. Um, the good news is that we don't get so much snow. Um, we still get snow enough to say, Merry Christmas, and, you know. Um, but uh, June is, is just really tough. Um, just around the corner, we've got the monsoon seasons coming. Um, if it's typical, um, last year was not. Um, usually monsoons hit like around July 4th. Right after the fireworks go off, monsoons hit. We start getting the afternoon rain showers, which is a great thing. It brings our temperature down. Um, humidity goes up a little bit, but our plants love it. So um, it, it's a great time of year to do your planting. Um, as far as watering goes, everybody that comes in with the question, the first thing I ask is, how much are you watering? Oh, I got a drip system. Well, to me, a drip system doesn't tell me how much you're watering. And it's all about the volume of water. Um, a lot of us don't know how much volume is actually coming out of our emitters. And that's the important piece of your drip system. 
Um, just because it's watering doesn't tell me it's going all the way down to the bottom of your roots. Um, if you are watering more than once or twice a week, you're watering way too much. Um, except for vegetable gardens, I will step back and say that. Um, your vegetable gardens, your pots, uh, there are some uh, instances where the twice a week thing doesn't work. But for most of your shrubs, your trees, uh, perennials even, once or twice a week should be plenty to, of water, as long as you're watering deeply. Um, we like to water deeply so your roots go down further. If we have a really dry, hot spell, if you have those roots that are 18 inches below the surface, they're going to stay a lot cooler. They're not going to notice the heat up above. If you're watering with a drip system that's running 20 minutes every other day, you're watering that top three inches, which basically dries out every day. You're not getting your bottom roots. So remember, learn your drip system, learn your emitters. Um, usually they're etched and they'll say, or they're color flagged, and each color has a, a, a gallon per hour. And, and so you need to have that set correctly so you can water very deeply. Um, and irrigation is a whole different set, setting, but take, your, take the time to, to get to know your system um, because it's really, really important. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is when the monsoons do hit, if you are getting rain pretty much daily and you're getting quite a bit of it, turn your system off, you know, and, and use some common sense as far as if, if you're, and it's really weird when the monsoons come in, sometimes you, everybody else is getting rain and you're not. Um, there, there are pockets that actually do get missed. Um, so just kind of keep an eye out, pay attention to your garden, um, and then you can catch a lot of these problems that we're having before everything starts. Um, with, with that being said, once the monsoons hit, um, really pay attention. Like Ken said earlier, um, we were talking about planting. Um, when you are planting a plant, we usually plant it even with the surface. We don't create wells uh, because we have this severe monsoon season. You can drown your plant during that time. So you want it even with the surface or even a little bit up um, so it can dry out. Um, it's very, very important that plants dry out in between waterings. Um, they, they like it, especially like roses. If you have problems with roses and you're watering a lot, Roses don't like wet feet. Uh, they would rather be dry than wet. Um, so there are certain plants that you, if you have a water meter or you're checking, let them dry out in between. If you're unsure, let it go. Wait an extra day and, and you'll, you'll be much more, the plant will be much more happy. Um, so this is a kind of a doctor's on call class. So we're gonna talk about bugs. Um, we've kind of seen the whole gambit of things that are going on right now. Um, we started off the season with thrips. Uh, those are the little, tiny little bugs that get our roses, our peonies, uh, trees. Uh, they'll, they'll, they basically get into the bud, strip the, the flower or the leaf, and that's why they come out and they're all crinkly. Our roses are all brown. Um, that's all by a little microscopic bug that you really, very hard to see. Um, one, as we're, we're starting to see less of them, they're still here, but we're starting to see less. Um, so usually they go away and then we get the next one, which is aphids usually, our, our aphids come in. Um, aphids are kind of interesting little bugs because they, they are all sorts of different colors. Um, there are black aphids, there's green aphids, um, orange aphids, uh, if you like milkweed, um, the orange aphids get those. Um, so kind of keep an eye out. If you're an avid gardener, you should be paying attention to your plants um, because you're going to catch these things before they become infestation. Um, so kind of pay attention to that. It, 
One of the first signs of aphids is a sticky residue on top of your leaves. Um, this is a honeydew that basically it's a secretion that, they, that the, the, the aphids, uh, basically that's their food. Uh, but um, you'll see that it, and then they're usually on the underside of a leaf and so it's really kind of hard to spray because you have to get underneath. Uh, we'll see them on roses and things like that. Um, so it's really important to be really on top of it so you can get rid of them. Um, the next thing we'll start seeing is the uh, budworms. And Ken and I were kind of walking through the greenhouse and it's like, there we are. Um, so if you have petunias, geraniums, and stuff like that, uh, in your pots and, and your raised beds, um, you start seeing holes like this. Um, these are budworms, and they are little caterpillars that kind of go in, they start munching. Uh, on your geraniums, you'll see a hole that just goes right through the bud. It looks like someone tried to sew through it. <laughs> um, and, and they're kind of interesting to the point where if they eat a red geranium, they kind of turn red. If they eat a, a pink one, they'll turn pink. Um, so pay attention to this as a sure sign and, and just start spraying it with the tea. Um, we'll go through the products in a little bit and, and I'll tell you which ones will work on all of them. Um, another big uh, bug that we've seen lately is the blister beetle. Um, these guys are fierce. Um, they can take a plant down in a matter of hours. Um, they're, and, and you can actually see them. Uh, they're little gray bugs that are usually splotchy. Um, they can be black and gray, but most of them, the ones I've seen lately, are gray with some black splotches on them. Um, they're a beetle bug, um, and, and they will take a plant uh, basically down to the ground. A gentleman came in the other day, he had a mimosa tree, and he actually showed me a video, and he's tapping his branch, and you just see it, it's like it's raining, and it was like, ooh! Um, so they're, they're pretty ferocious, and the, the water's multi-purpose sprayer, great for that. Um, because it's a contact killer and it basically kills them instantly. Um, so pay attention to your plants. Um, the other thing that we get a lot of is grasshoppers. Um, grasshoppers are deadly. They'll eat everything in sight. Um, now is the time to take care of them. Uh, we do have the Nolo bait on hand. Um, Nolo bait is a biologic um, insecticide it's not an insecticide but it, it does something to their internal organs um, so it makes them so when they do reproduce they it, it, it's kind of nasty but anyway it basically drops the chain of reproduction um, so get them down when they're small and you you won't have those big guys that can eat a plant in a matter of moments um, spider mite is another one that we get a ton of and um, those are kind of hard to find because they're very very small um, what you're kind of looking for is you'll see some modeling on the leaves the speckles um, you'll also see a fine layer of um, webbing um, and they're, they're really, really tiny. Uh, we see them a lot on trees and shrubs. Alberta spruces are notorious for getting spider mites. Uh, we've seen them in junipers. Um, a few, I've seen a few pine trees that have them, but mostly your shrubs, smaller things that you, you see. Um, so there's a lot of different bugs out there. And uh, just to go over some of the products that will uh, get rid of them, um, for everything that I've mentioned, uh, the multi-purpose spray uh, has the permethrin, which is a crushed, a synthetic crushed chrysanthemum. Um, 
the triple action actually has neem oil um, and the pyrethrin, which is the true version of the crushed chrysanthemum. Um, so we use both of these products. Spider mites, having the oil helps uh, kill those. They're, they're really tough to kill. Um, if you have a really bad infection, we bump it up to the 38, which is 38% pyrethrin or permethrin. Uh, which is a higher dose of this. Um, one uh, note on the triple action, because it has the neem oil, you have to be very careful when you apply this. Uh, because it is oil-based, if you put it on in the heat of the day, you're gonna fry your plant. Um, so put it on in the evening when it's cool, so it has all night to kind of absorb, or get up early in the morning before the sun gets hot and put it on. I like to do it at night because I have a little bit more time uh, to get it on. Uh, it's really, really important that you don't fry your plants because you'll have bigger problems down the road. Uh, we were talking about the budworms, and uh, we're going to talk about the tomato hornworms in a moment uh, when we talk about tomatoes. But this is BT. Um, it, it's uh, Baculus thuricide. Um, this is an organic biologic product that takes care of caterpillars. Uh, so if you have those tent worms that tend to get in the trees, uh, cutworms, uh, the tomato worms, uh, the bud worms, this is what we use to spray on them. Um, it, it works really, really well on caterpillars. Uh, we used to sell Captain Jack's um, a long time ago. Uh, we replaced it with this. It, it just does a better job with, with uh, the, the caterpillars and worms. Uh, cabbage worms, uh, skeletonizers on grapevines, things like that. This works really well. Um, this is the Nolo Bait. Um, this is a biologic, it's a powder. Um, basically, they kind of take a, a bran flake and, and it's been processed. And this is a, it, there's a pheromone in it that'll attract them. So don't put this in the middle of your garden because then your grasshoppers will come to your garden. So put it on the outside of your garden area. Um, don't get it wet because once it's wet, it, it, it loses its effectiveness. So kind of keep it dry, as dry as possible. Um, I put it on the outside of my garden beds um, so I can get the grasshoppers out of my garden and then I can track them towards the fence. And so hopefully I'm creating a barrier for them. Um, but it works really well. Um, I used it last year. I, I'm not. I, I'm seeing some, but I'm not seeing as many as I saw last year. So you, you do cut down the population as you go. Okay. Um, so we're going to move on to diseases. Um, diseases are one of the problems that we tend to see. Um, occasionally in the springtime, um, shot hole is one of the main ones that we see around here. Um, it's basically a little hole in a, a, a leaf. Um, if you have a second, those trees actually came in with them. The, the purple leaf plums that are back there, they actually came in that way. So we're not the only ones that have it. Um, but they've been treated, uh, so it, it's, it's done, it's gone, it, it's, uh, it's just kind of one of those things. So the, hole, the holes in the plant are kind of unsightly, but it, it's not going to, it's not one of those that is going to kill your plant because it's got this disease. Um, another infection that we tend to get is the black spot. We see this on roses, uh, aspens will get it. Uh, a few other trees can get the black spot. Um, so what's really important about fun fungal issues is the cleanup in the fall. Um, you want to make sure that anything that has a fungal issue, that when it dies back, when it loses its leaves, clean up that mess. Uh, don't let it contaminate the dirt that's there. 
Um, clean that up. Don't put those leaves in your compost bin because you're just going to add to your issues next year. Uh, just dispose of them. Um, throw them in the trash can. Get rid of them that way. Um, Another one that we're fixing to get into because the monsoons will be hitting is the powdery mildew. Um, powdery mildew is kind of that white, um, it's kind of almost, it almost looks fuzzy to me on top of your leaves. Um, this will hit when our, we get these hot temperatures and then we get cool really quick. Um, we see it on our cucumber plants, our, our squash plants. Um, Monarda is a, a flower that is just notorious for it. Um, it's one of those you just, ah, why? Um, but it's one of those things that, that if you treat it early enough, sometimes you can actually keep it from happening. So starting next week, I'm gonna start putting on uh, the Revitalize, which is our I didn't grab the Revitalize. Oh, I did. Okay. Um, Revitalize is our fungicide. Um, it is a biofungicide. Uh, bio so uh, it works a couple of different ways. Um, you can use this as a foliar spray. Uh, so mix it up in a spray bottle and, and spray down your foliage. Uh, you can also use this as a soil drench. Uh, so you're going to water your planting area really well and then you're going to mix this up in a, a couple of watering cans and drench that soil. So most fun fungal issues arise from, you know, your, your uh, you water, things splash, it, it kind of goes up, um, birds hop through the dirt and then jump on your trees and things. So there's a lot of different ways for this to spread. The wind blows, it gets on it. So uh, it's just a fact of life. Um, you will get it, guaranteed. Um, so I always start as a preventative measure doing it before the monsoons hit. Because if they're fortified beforehand, they don't get as bad after when it, all the conditions are right for it. Um, so this should be in your arsenal as well. Um, yes? I know it's some of the veronica, the veronicas are, are subs to, you know, get powdery melody. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, yeah. but some of them. And it's, it's, fact, it's, I bought some from mail last year, and two out of three of them powdery mildew on them and I, you know, make them better before I planted them. Sure. And, and like I said, there are certain plants that are susceptible. She was saying that she got some uh, Veronica mail order and they actually came in with it with powdery mildew. I would have sent it back. <laughs> but um, uh, you just have to pay attention to things. Um, it happens, like I said, it, it's not something to stress about. It, it can be controlled. Uh, the one thing with fungal issues is that once the d disease is on the leaf, that leaf is never going to change. Uh, it's better to pick it off. Um, if it's all over the plant, kind of be careful with it that way. Um, I would just spray it very well so it doesn't spread. Um, and it kind of depends on the plant, whether that plant will actually live or die. Powder and mildew is uh, one of the tougher uh, diseases to catch, especially if you don't catch it early enough. Um, so again, uh, cleanup is necessary. We want to make sure that the wind doesn't blow. Uh, um, but if you have to clean up your area really well, you don't cost, compost any of those leaves. Uh, very, very important on that. Um, segueing into veggies and vegetable problems, um, powdery mildew can happen on like tomato plants. Uh, that we were talking about squash and cucumbers and things like that. Um, crop rotation with your vegetable gardens is very, very crucial. Um, 
especially if you do get a disease like early blight or the versiculum uh, wilt uh, or ferrocium wilt and then the ver, ver I'm really bad with pronunciation but the ver the VERT wilt um, thank you um, so these are things that tomatoes are pretty notorious on getting um, so when you are looking for tomato plants look for disease resistant plants um, most of the growers have gone to the VV um, so it, it basically is saying those are resistant to certain things um, but crop rotation never plant a tomato plant in the same spot that it was last year. You want to move them in your garden bed. Um, if you are putting them in a pot or a container, you want to basically dump out that container, rinse it very well, spray it with the bleach solution, let it dry, and then you can reuse it. Um, but you don't you reuse the dirt. You can use it for something else, but don't reuse that dirt for your vegetables or your tomatoes um, because if you had it last year you're going to get it again um, so it, it's really really important to be careful with that um, yes so was the revitalized good for the, the mildew and the black spots both yes the, her question was was the revitalized good for uh, basically it's a fungicide so it'll take care of all the fungal issues it also works really well on fire blight which your apple trees your pear trees can get um, uh, roses actually can get fire blight as well. Photinias can get it too. So it, it's one of those things that you have to be really careful. Um, since I'm talking about fire blight, uh, one thing to note if you do ever get fire blight, um, our first instinct is to cut it. Um, before you cut, fix yourself up a bleach solution. Uh, one part bleach, 10 parts water. Every you want to, if you have fire blight, you want to go down eight inches below, eight inches into the green part. Fire blight, you'll, your stem is going to turn black. Uh, you want to go down eight inches from the black part into the green and do your cut. Um, when you cut, you're going to take your pruners and dip them in that bleach. Don't go to something else because you'll spread it from one branch to another. Uh, so it's really, really important to, to clean your clippers uh, because you can't pass it around that way too. Um, so back to your veggie garden. Um, a couple of things that usually happens to, to our vegetable gardens right now, um, the cutworms um, earlier in the season can come and nip your seedlings. Um, the tomato worms, we haven't seen them yet, but kind of keep an eye out for them. If you guys haven't seen them, they're basically a green worm that's probably as big as my finger, um, and they're bright green. You can't see them next to a tomato plant because um, they look, they blend right in. Um, you can use the BT. You can also pick them off and, and chuck them as far as you can throw them. Um, but or step on them or whatever you want to do um, but you can't they're pretty easy to pick off because they are so so huge um, <laughs> oh very good what? she picks them before when they're in eggs um, basically it's a parasite a parasitic wasp actually lays the eggs and, and then they turn into these hornworms so that that's interesting that you caught it. It's, she's a very avid no, gardener. I, when, she's when I go and water them and I look every week. Perfect. And uh, when I meet some, you know, of course, uh, when they hunt, uh -huh. you could see you could see that they were there because uh, they're already Yeah. No, you just start looking. Forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she's very. Uh, she pays attention to her garden, which is great. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> Yes. I've also read about and did this. You pick them off, and you might want to wear gloves because they can be. They can kind of grip the stem pretty much, yeah. and they're kind of big and squishy and fat. You want to, and you drop them into soapy water solution, and that. There you go. So, you have to like so, so she uh, says you have to be careful with those horn worms because that they, 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 they're 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 sticky and they'll grab onto you. Um, so probably wear gloves. Um, she actually 
takes a little bucket of water, soapy water, and drops them in there, and they'll, they'll drown that way. So there you go. <laughs> so there's all sorts of home remedies that they're pretty easy to take care of. So uh, that's one thing. Um, let's see. Blossom end rot. Um, everybody's had tomatoes that kind of turn black on the bottom. Um, people have had squash that kind of start out really good, we're all excited, and then it just kind of shrivels up to the end. Um, flowers still on it, and it, then it doesn't do nothing. Um, blossom end rot is a lack of calcium. Um, Plants need that calcium for vegetables, uh, which is one of the reasons why we went to the fruit and vegetable uh, food. Um, it does have 6% calcium in it, so um, hopefully we're all using that in our vegetable gardens. If you haven't, you can use gypsum. It also has calcium in it. Um, but this time in the year, if you have not put any calcium into your gardens, um, there is a way to get calcium on the plant uh, right now. Where did it go? Okay, this is called rot stop. Um, basically, this is your blossom end rot. Um, this is a calcium uh, spray that you actually just spray onto the plant. It absorbs, it gets that calcium it needs so your tomatoes will be nice and red and ripe. Uh, put it on your squash plants, your zu uh, zucchini plants, um, even your cucumbers uh, will appreciate that extra dose of calcium on them. Um, and, and all your vegetables will, will appreciate this. Uh, you'll get better set, fruit set, if you start using it now. Um, and that calcium will give you a, a riper, like more flavorful fruit because that calcium ingredient helps. Did you have a question? Any of these sprays, the uh, Revitalize or the neem oil or something, what about animals, uh, uh, pets? Okay, so basically any spray that you put on, if while you're spraying, keep your pets inside, let them dry, let it dry, and everything will be fine. Um, the, 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 unless they eat a ton of the plant, or a ton of plant, yeah. cool. All right, um, tomato plants. Um, how many people have had blossoms that have started to drop off? <laughs> All right. Um, basically, there's a several reasons that this happens. Um, one of them is that cold spell that we had uh, last week. Um, the temperature fluctuations. Uh, tomatoes are a tropical plant. Um, they like our nighttime temperatures above 50. Um, we had several days that we were in the upper 40s. I mean, we weren't cold, but we were in the upper 40s. And, and they kind of said, ah! So, um, for the most part, that's probably why you've got a lot of that. Uh, the other reason is, um, Consistency in watering. Um, tomatoes are very, they're not picky, but they like consistent watering. So if you are watering 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the after, uh, afternoon, great, keep it up. Um, if you're watering once a day, that's great. As long as you're water, making sure that your plants are watered very deeply, you're good to go. Um, if you're one of those that Oh, I didn't get it to it today. I went so I, I went two days, and so now I'm going to water. This is when the inflectuation on that watering is going to start. Your your tomato is going to start showing signs of, of stress, and blossom drop is one of those. Um, so it's really important to be very consistent. Whatever works on your place, your garden, keep up with it. You know, if it, like I said, if you're watering in the morning and the afternoon that's great um, just keep consistent especially with our monsoons coming um, when we've all had tomatoes that have just blistered and cracked um, that is when the tomato has dried out and then it gets this rush of water and, and so it just plumps up and then it just expands so much that the tomato actually cracks um, 
So it, you can still eat that tomato, it's just kind of unsightly, um, but it's really important to be very consistent. Um, the more consistent you are when the monsoons come, you won't get as much of that. Um, another important thing is fertilization. Um, we water our gardens more than we water anything else in, in our landscape. So make sure that you are fertilizing a little more often than you do your trees and shrubs. Um, I have some raised beds and I usually want, uh, fertilize those about once a month. We're leaching that, all those nutrients out regularly. Um, and, and I fertilize two ways. I use our fruit and vegetable um, fertilizer. I also use the flower power every two weeks. Um, they both have uh, a little bit different nutrients. Um, the flower power has that very high middle number, which is our phosphorus, and, and that is for our blooms. Uh, so anybody that's got hanging baskets, our squash, our tomato plants, anything that we want to keep blooming, use that every two weeks when you water. Um, we kind of call our regular fertilizer our bread and butter. So that just kind of puts down that main uh, course of nutrients. And then the flower power is just like dessert. So we just keep that going all summer long. And both of them are kind of lighter. They're, the flower power is water soluble, so it soaks through um, the uh, Granular fertilizer is slow release, so you're not going to get burned um, unless you use it every day. Um, but other than that, you'll be fine. Okay. Um, other diseases that um, tomatoes can get is sun scald. Um, sun scald usually is a light tan uh, spot on tomatoes. It can go on peppers. Uh, sometimes I've never seen it on squash or cucumbers, but usually it's on my tomatoes and peppers that I've seen. And usually it's on fruit that's kind of up on top. Um, if you're a heavy pruner on your tomatoes, kind of be careful with that. Don't over prune your tomato plant um, because those green leaves can protect your tomatoes from the heat that we tend to get in June. So as those tomatoes are getting bigger, they, they get sunburned just like the rest of us. So be careful with that. Leaf roll. How many people have had tomatoes that actually had leaves kind of curl up? Um, so curling up isn't such a bad thing. Um, this can be a, a couple of reasons this can happen. Um, curling up can be just because of the heat. Um, they kind of do that to protect themselves uh, because it's so hot. Um, the other thing that it can be is that the plant is staying too wet. So be careful with your watering. Um, again, plants don't like to be super wet. They like to be moist, but not wet. Um, the other thing that they get is what we were talking about before. Um, the the I wish I could pronounce this word, but the uh, ferrocerium wilt. So ferrocerium wilt is a tomato plant that you go out today, your tomato's great. Tomorrow you go out and half your plant is just kind of wilted. It's like, what's going on? So our first instinct is to water. We, maybe we missed it or whatever, and, and it just gets worse. Um, this is a, a fungal disease uh, that uh, is, is pretty bad. So if it does not, you, you spray it with the fungicide and it doesn't correct itself within, I'd say, a week, pull that plant. It, it's something you don't want to sit there and uh, continue to fester. Uh, you want to get rid of that, that altogether. Um, use and revitalize in that area so hopefully we can kill any bacteria that's kind of living in that spot. Um, the verticillium uh, wilt is a whole different thing. Um, basically this starts as a kind of a yellowish brown splotch on your tomato leaves and then they stop start kind of dropping. Um, this is another bad disease and there's not a lot you can do with it. Yank that plant out, get rid of it. Unfortunately, you're going to have to start over. 
Um, so those are the two serious diseases that you have to pay attention to. Um, there are some um, early blight is another one. Um, sometimes if you catch that early enough, you can continue with the plant um, because sometimes if you catch it, you can take care of it. You're, you won't have such a strong plant, but you can still produce tomatoes and things. Um, it's just a matter of catching it soon enough. Um, which is always why you should have an arsenal of insecticides, fungicides. Um, if you're using spray bottles, you should have one for each, uh, each thing that you have. Um, it's really important not to mi mix your herbicides with any of your other products. You put an herb or your, your stuff you're going to put on your vegetables in an herbicide bottle, you're basically going to kill your plant. So. Um, be really careful, label your, your spray bottles so that doesn't happen. Um, leaf spot is another disease tomatoes get. Um, and and um, some, so most plants will get spots on the leaves. Sometimes it's not, it, it's just because of the heat, it, it just happens. Um, but if they get bigger, if you start seeing like target rings around them, that's when you need to start being concerned. If you have questions, bring leaves in. We have a microscope down here. Uh, we have some very smart folks that can help you to diagnose those uh, issues and tell you whether it's time to yank the plant or it's something that we can take care of. Um, so um, we can take care of it early enough so you can actually get a crop. All right, I think I've done my Disease and diagnosis spiel, yes. So an herbicide is a weed killer. Um, so be really careful with anything around that. Um, I actually just pull my weeds out of my garden. Um, you can also use like shredded newspaper um, in your rows if you have them. Uh, that can kind of cut back on your weed growth and all that stuff too. Um, so be really careful with your herbicides in your garden. All right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So she had a lilac. She had a lilac that started coming out, and then it just kind of. Um, that's where I was going. Um, and it just kind of shriveled up. So she bought it about two months ago. So we were back in uh, early April, early March. Um, and we did have some cold spells. Um, that's why if you come in here later in the afternoon it, during those times, we've got everything covered. Because um, we're trying to protect the, the buds on the plant so when they bloom, they'll be beautiful for you. Um, but cold can cause that. Um, also the thrip can cause buds to kind of just shrivel up and, and go away. So um, I, I think it was the cold more than anything. Yeah. So she has a, a rose that is really struggling because of all the different uh, bug issues and she's wondering if she should replace it and put another rose in that sit, sit area. Unfortunately, all of those bugs, it doesn't matter what part of your yard, they're going to go there anyway. So if it's a good spot for you, go ahead and use it. Just stay on top of them. Uh, most of these sprays say use every 14 to 21 days. Use it more if you need to. Um, it, just make sure you're using it at the right time of day. Um, I can't stress that enough to use it at the right time of day. Okay? Nice. Yeah. At night or, like I said, early in the morning when the breeze is blowing so it's not going to go everywhere else. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so she, she's got new plants uh, that she's had two months, two weeks. Yeah, she's got a couple of different things. So when we plant newly planted plants, we tell folks to water once or twice a week, depending on your area. Um, and you, all of our brochures say twice a week. I kind of have, because of your area, we have so many different conditions around here. Um, if you have heavy clay soil, it tends to hold that moisture in. 
So I always tell people, start with twice a week. If you water on Monday and your next watering day is Thursday, check it. If, if Thursday it's still moist, don't, don't water. Um, and, and then do the same thing next week. If it's still wet on Thursday, you're probably one of those that can water once a week and, and still have a healthy plant. Um, if you are up on Thumb Butte and you have very porous soil where it just it basically evaporates, you might have to water twice a week, maybe even more, because your soil just it, it just goes down. Um, so we have watering rules, but they're they're not cut and dry. So pay attention to your plants. If you have questions, please call us. Let us know what's going on. Um, We'll try to help you the best we can. Okay. Yes. So uh, her question was, is that he had mentioned not watering at night, and the basic fact is that plants uh, that are moist at night can tend to have fungal issues. So watering early in the morning is the best time of day to water. Um, evaporation um, and um, it, it'll water you know it has time to soak in before the sun comes up and all that um, if you have a drip system and, and it's kind of on the ground and you're not splashing and stuff like that you can water at night but like I said it, it, it's, it's part of that prone to fungal issues you're, you're kind of asking for trouble Yeah, yeah, because fungal issues can happen on flowers and shrubs and all sorts of stuff, so yeah. Yes? What's the treatment for thrip? Uh, her question was what the treatment was, is for thrip, and that is the multi-purpose spray and the, uh, the uh, triple action. Um, they're kind of one and the same, except our, our multi-purpose spray doesn't have the neem oil. So, like I said, I like to use the, the multi-purpose because it doesn't have it and I don't have to worry about it burning. I can use it in the morning before I go to work. Spittle bugs are one of those nasty little things that it actually looks like someone spit on your plant. It, it's a kind of a foamy thing on, uh, and it happens on grapevines and, and some other things. Um, the multi-purpose spray will take care of that. So just spray it down really well and, and you'll be good to go. The, the, the multi-purpose spray, yeah. Yeah. That's the revitalized. Yeah. Okay. Fun stuff now. Um, with vegetable gardens, pollination is really important. So make sure you plant your flowers with, along with your vegetable gardens. Uh, this is an annual, this is a, pen, a red pentas. Uh, loves the heat, loves the sun. Butterflies, I can't tell you how many butterflies we have on these. Um, if they're sitting on the dock, they just came in. They, they're just covered, especially the swallowtails love this guy. Um, so invite those guys to you. Um, the salvia, the blue salvias, um, the, butterfly, or the bees love these guys. And this is what you need for pollinization. Your butterflies, your bees, all uh, will help spread that pollen so you get good fruit production. This is yellow yarrow, uh, moonshine yarrow. This is one of our plants of the month. Uh, this is a very nice plant because it's uh, animal resistant. Uh, most of your javelina, your deer, all of those will leave this alone. Um, it, rabbits too. Um, it has really bright yellow. Once this opens up, this is going to be bright yellow uh, flowers. Yes, sir. Can you get them in uh, red? Yes. Uh, these guys have come in a bunch of different colors and the leaves are a little bit different too. Um, we actually have some down there right now. Um, I think we have the terracotta and then I thought we had some red ones. Uh, but check down there. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, they do.
Exactly. Uh, this is one of our new shrub roses. Um, this is uh, Monrovia has come out with uh, a, a new couple of lines. Um, one of them is Grace and Grit. Um, it's a shrub rose that gets about five feet tall. Um, this rose uh, is a versatile shrub rose, and it's one that you don't have to mess with too much. Yes, they still get the bugs. Um, sometimes they'll get black spot, um, but you don't have to deadhead them like you do your normal uh, hybrid tea roses. Uh, uh, you prune in the uh, early spring. Um, just like everybody else, but you don't have to, man I mean, they don't need a lot of care as far as, you know, cutting them back and just so you get, get three blooms. Um, this guy is the Nitty Gritty Pink. Um, this is a smaller rose, so he's only going to get in that two to three foot range. Um, the Grit and, Grit and Grace, like I said, gets five feet. And I love this time of year um, because the crepe myrtles start coming in. Um, this is the very, uh, very dazzle. This is a dwarf one. Um, he only gets in that three foot range, so he's a small uh, shrub uh, crepe myrtle. And you get the really pretty flowers, uh, but he doesn't get super, super big. Yes. Uh, they, he is his own six, um, so we are his own seven here, and the way the hardiness zone goes is that the older it gets. So pretty I had to bring him out um, but um, now's a great time to get fruit in grapes are one of those that do really really well here they don't mind crappy soil um, <laughs> to put it bluntly um, they actually thrive in it so um, if you're looking at some fruits and, and vegetables uh, the grapes are great to get started And these guys are just pretty. Um, their, their new foliage uh, is awesome. Um, and we, I have two different varieties of this pretty orange color. Um, this is the orange rocket. It is a barberry. Um, he uh, kind of gets in that four to five foot tall and he stays pretty narrow, so two to three foot wide. Um, just gives you some great color uh, in the garden. Um, very easy to maintain. Um, he is a deciduous plant, which means he's going to lose his leaves in the winter time. Um, he does bloom early in the spring, so he does have little red berries that'll be on the, the, the branches in the winter time. So he isn't ugly in the winter, um, but you can't beat this color, you know. Um, uh, they're no, they're they're just ornamental. The birds will love them. Um, this is a admiration bar, Mary. No, cherry bomb. He doesn't look cherry. Um, he is basically kind of the same plant, uh, but he's short. He's only going to get two feet. So there are, if you find something that you like, check around, ask one of us, because there's usually a smaller version if you need smaller or a bigger version if you need bigger. These are two of my other favorites. Um, these are potentias. Um, um, these are sh colorful shrubs that bloom 
all summer long. Um, they have these bright yellow flowers. Um, they are deciduous, so again, these are one of those that are gonna die back in the winter time. Uh, you just kind of trim them up, round them out, and then they're ready to go for spring. Uh, but you just can't beat that happy yellow in your garden. Um, very Pocatia. You're gonna ask me to spell? <laughs> Here, let me give you that. Take that and spell it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so both of these plants, uh, the big one is going to get in that four foot range. Uh, this is the gold drop, and he's going to get in that three by three size range. So if you have a smaller area, he's perfect for that. And you guys can come and take a look at any of these. Um, when we wrap this up, if you have any other questions, please feel free to ask me. Um, Doug is here. Megan is here. Uh, so we, we'll help you answer any questions that you might see fit. Um, uh, let's see. This is just one of my favorite evergreens. Um, this is a golden euonymus. Um, this is great uh, for if you have sunny or shady spots. Um, pretty versatile plant. Uh, this guy kind of gets in that three by three range. Um, he stays his color all winter long, so he is an evergreen. Um, huh? Ah, never been there. Yeah, they are cold hardy. Did you water in the winter? Uh, wet wheat. Um, because we got the snow. So right, I okay. Don't, uh, okay. I don't water when the snow And while she's talking about watering, um, one thing I did not mention is it is important to water in the winter time. Um, most of us turn off our water systems because we're worried about frost. Drag your hose out. If we do not get any measurable, and measurable is the key word, uh, rain or snowfall, pull your hose out, hit all your yard. Um, if your root systems dry out, and winter time is usually our driest time that we have uh, because we don't pay attention to it. It's cold, I don't need to water, but we do um, because our, our system dries out. But you only have to water every two weeks. So, so you don't have to do it all the time, just every two weeks to, to do that. Um, are we, can I keep going or you want me to shut up? <laughs> keep going? Show the okay. rest of the plants. So this guy is just pretty. Um, this is a dahlia. Um, uh, he's called a tahio. Um, gorgeous. Um, our dahlias here in this area um, need a little bit of afternoon shade. Um, they can't take that hot afternoon sun. So kind of be careful where you plant them, but they're very, very pretty. And you can't beat that flower. Um, I have some yellow ones in there, and they're actually dinner plate dahlias, and I, I swear it was twice the size of my hand. Um, really pretty. Yes, you do. Um, these will not survive our winter. It's an annual here. <laughs> Okay, so this is a, a pugster butterfly bush. And again, like I said, with the potentias and the barberries, there's usually a, I've got feedback. Um, there are different sizes for different areas. So pugster is gonna get in that two to three foot instead of that six to eight or five to six that we usually get. So right now we have three different sizes of, of um, butterfly bushes. So there's always something size of the garden. Um, really smells really good, so if you get a chance, smell them. This is another favorite evergreen. Um, this is actually a conifer. Um, this is a dwarf globe spruce. Um, he is going to get in that four to five foot range as far as your, his height and just nice round globe size. Um, very versatile, very drought tolerant. Really nice plant to have, and it he keeps this color, this spruce color, and it doesn't get screwed. Okay. This is a pen.
Penstemon. Um, Penstemons usually bloom in the spring um, or early summer, which we're right about now. Um, if you travel along our highways, uh, 89 and going down to Phoenix down there, uh, there's all sorts of these uh, different colors growing alongside the road. Um, reds, blues, pinks. Uh, so the penstemons come in all sorts of different colors. They, they, they are perennials and they do see themselves. So they, they're both. Uh, Glardias, um, another very versatile plant, uh, can take the full sight, the full heat. Um, come in different colors. This one's the red. Um, they also come in the yellow and red, um, also known as blanket flower. Um, really pretty extra garden perennial um, that come back year after year. Um, I have found that sometimes I'll lose these during the winter, um, so I usually take time to let them kind of go to seed um, in the fall, and then I'll just throw the seeds where I have them and If I happen to lose them, I'll have extras. And last but not least, our Russian sage. Um, the only reason I brought this out is it's great for pollination. Um, the bees love this guy. Um, so if you need some extra pollinization near your garden, I would say plant one of these. Put it in the back where you're not going to be around it because the bees will come. Um, I wouldn't want it next to my front door or any of that. but. Um, if you're looking to bring those pollinators in, this is a good plant to do so. Um, it is very weedy plant. Uh, it does send out suckers all over the place. So put it in a spot where you have it room to grow. <laughs> all right, on that note, we're going to uh, call it. And if you guys have questions, I'll be here and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.